Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at Sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello and welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1351. I'm FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris, and it's a tradition in the FDH Lounge to review some of our finest guest moments from the last 100 mini episodes. These are some of the best moments that we've had for mini episodes 1251 to 1350, the ones that really emphasize the reality that we are the show where nothing is off topic. I hear the same garbage type stuff from people too, and even from good friends of mine about the alleged death rate. First of all, I don't believe at all that it's 1% because I think there's been an undercount not just here but globally. I don't trust China's numbers. I don't trust Iran's numbers. Uh, And and here, because of the the testing being a national disgrace, I don't trust the numbers here as well. So I I think the, the, the count of cases as well as the fatalities, I think there's an undercount rather than an overcount. You hear the conspiracy people, oh, well, hospitals have a, a, a you know a financial incentive to put COVID-19 on the death certificate. I don't think that comes close to matching the undercount. Uh, whatever overcount you get in specific instances, I don't think comes close to matching the other side of it. That's just my guess anyways. But in looking at this here, this whole situation, that's my biggest fear with this thing is what you just said about the ongoing effects. If I get this, I don't think I'm going to die. My concerns are, I don't want it to spread it to anybody else. I live in close proximity uh, to a number of old people. I wouldn't want that on my conscience. And uh, again, the long-term effects of this thing. I ain't looking to get something I'm going to have to carry around for the next several decades of my life. And I think more people ought to be looking at it through that prism. You'd have a lot less people taking stupid chances if that was the case. And i got to say, and I'm just going to editorialize here, uh, nobody else has to associate themselves with my remarks unless they want to, but I think we've learned, when you're talking about globally, Janelle, I think we've learned a lot of very disappointing things about the fabric of this country this year and the rampant irresponsibility that's out there. And it's one thing to embrace freedom as we Americans want to do, but freedom without responsibility is just basically license. And uh, the, the, the number of people who just don't give a crap about anybody else, we, we've learned a lot more about the bad side of this country this year than I think a lot of us really would have anticipated. And again, it all just comes back to eliminating irresponsibility. If we weren't as irresponsible as a people, if we just handle this thing better as far as having our own discipline, even without leadership from above, which we could bemoan, I think, at federal, state, and local levels throughout this thing based on where you live. But if people themselves were more responsible, this thing would have faded to a fraction of what it is, I believe. Well, I I agree with you to a point because responsibility is based on knowledge and education. And the public health education system in this country has been underfunded and broken for a very long time. Being a health educator is not a well-paying job. Even with a master's degree, it starts out at around 40000 a year, if you can get a job in the field, um, because there's not, not a lot of funding at the county health level. But in response to what you just said, I, I've got uh, three points. First of all, yeah, I, I concur with you. Uh, number Point number two is I, I use this analogy in terms of undercounting or overcounting corona death. It's like this. My dad has Parkinson's, okay? His ability to balance and stand, uh, he, he'd rather walk than stand. And now if he has to stand for long periods of time, he gets tired, he, he uses a cane, and his balance is a little off, okay? He's doing well. He's been diagnosed for 10 plus years. He also has some kidney disease, but I, I, I'm talking more about his balance situation now. So let's say he comes to New York City to visit me, and he's standing, I want you to put him in, as an example, but let's just say someone who isn't very strong, who doesn't have good balance, is standing on the platform, the train is coming, and somebody shoves them from behind. They can't catch their balance, they stumble 10 or 12 steps, they go off the edge of the platform and get run over by the train and die. So what is the cause of death? Did they get hit by a train and that's why they 
died, or is it the shove that killed them? Or is it because they didn't have good balance and couldn't catch their balance in time before they went off the edge? That is a perfect analogy to me because even though young people might be able to turn around and, and shove that person back and get into a fist fight and the train goes by without hurting anybody, that's just them. They're the ones who can who can take that kind of push from behind. But there are a lot of people who cannot. And if you want to say, no, they died of pneumonia or no, they died of they died of cardiac arrest. Well, we never had this conversation in the AIDS epidemic. They died of AIDS. But actually, technically, many of the folks who died of AIDS actually died of pneumonia. Right. But that was an infection that was secondary to the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which was caused by the human immuno, immuno uh, deficiency virus. So we can play word games all we want, but what is it that's causing the, the person's inability to fight off the virus? So is it, was it diabetes? No, they were living with diabetes before they got infected with coronavirus. And then if they die, do you want to say that coronavirus had nothing to do with it because they had diabetes? But they didn't die of diabetes. They were living with diabetes before their infection. So this is just part of the, I think, health education that really has not been done in this country. And other countries have done a much better job at educating the public so that they're already primed to understand um, what it means to distance and to mask and to practice good hygiene. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this country realize how infrequently they wash their hands when they really should be washing their hands more often. When you look at China, when you, you see what we're up against there, and, and obviously it is important, this year has underscored how important it is to stand up to them, to draw a tough line. Uh, but in terms of the brinksmanship that uh, some people seem to be uh, advocating right now, loud voices in the Congress, special interests, I would also say uh, the military-industrial complex as well. I is there any sense that you're getting of realization that we are dealing with, uh, I don't know if it's quite a co-equal nuclear power, but a nuclear power nonetheless? I mean, there are very tangible consequences of going to war with a country that can fire nuclear weapons right back at your country. Is, is there any sense that you're getting from any of these hawks about the danger that could happen if this thing spirals out of control? No, but they don't tend to evaluate their past failures. You know, <laughs> they're not learning lessons from, you know, they still think that maximum pressure on Iran has worked, and they've never reevaluated their support for the Iraq war. Um, so you can't really look to these guys for a lot of introspection. Um, and they're not... What's really a little scary is that they always reach for the same playbook. And like you're pointing out, this is, we are, Iran might be a middle tier country in terms of, you know, how their population, their wealth, and their military. But China is almost a co-equal superpower. It's not somebody we can pressure in the same kind of way. Also, if we want to make serious inroads on the trade issues, we can't do that single-handedly. We will need other countries to support us in, you know, backing away from using China as the supplier for all these different things that in the coronavirus pandemic, we're clearly seeing the pitfalls of relying on China. So we have a rare opportunity to convince other countries that this is important, but we can't go about it the same way where we just sort of do our own thing, and much, much of it actually scares other countries off because it seems to be overly militaristic and overly, you know, leaning towards those options as opposed to um, moving China into um, making decisions that we would want them to make rather than pushing them, you know, towards a more militaristic response. There's always a lot of gravity that goes with uh, a change in administrations. Uh, sometimes they move uh, more smoothly than others. Uh, and for those of us that lived through uh, 2000 to 2001 and thought there were some bumps in the road there, uh, 20 years later, uh, we hadn't seen anything yet uh, compared to that. But uh, we are here now in this time, William, and uh, a new administration has come in and uh, has a mandate, I think, in, in a couple of different areas, certainly to take this pandemic seriously, uh, which represents, I have to say, obviously a change in pace uh, from what was in there 
previously, and uh, the, the the early thing uh, here, the, the stimulus package that's going through appears to be emblematic of that. Uh, I know it won't be the only effort uh, that the administration has going, but how do you assess the early days here, uh, William, where you have a House that's relatively close and a Senate that is exactly 50-50 with Vice President Harris as the tiebreaker? You know, I, I would say that uh, many Americans, maybe even most Americans, are just every day breathing a sigh of relief that we have a change of administration, that we have uh, a president who cares about governing who cares about the American people, who cares about getting stuff done instead of having his own ego stroked on a daily basis. I cannot tell you what a relief it is to uh, uh, reconnect with our allies around the world, to not uh, have the daily distraction of the stupidity of the Trumpian uh, Twitter feed, uh, to have the narcissistic behavior, to have the inane policies uh, it's just it's just a relief. It's a breath of fresh air. Obviously, got a lot of problems. Uh, you know, it's just a, a horrific fact that uh, our country is absolutely, by leaps and bounds, the worst uh, victim, I guess, if you will, of the uh, uh, of the COVID pandemic. We handled it the worst of any country in the world, which is beyond shocking. But I think we're beginning to get our together, both with the vaccines, with people's pain. And uh, there's obviously going to be a major stimulus package, whether it's too big or too small or just right or whether it can get through with any bipartisan support. I mean, I think that the time has come to put the reckless behavior of the past five years behind us and get on to, uh, you know, making the country uh, stable and secure and happy again. Nobody's talking about redistricting. And it's a very important underlying aspect of this election all throughout the 2020s. This is going to determine how state legislature lines are drawn, the federal legislative lines, etc. It's of paramount importance, and I think you're right. Democrats are eating the Republicans' lunch here, reversing the gains that the Republicans have made over the last 20 to 30 years. And I think we're going to see that play out. And as such, I fully expect that those who have been defending gerrymandering will decry it, and those who have been decrying gerrymandering will defend it. So that's how these things uh, go. No, actually, actually um, I think there is a very strong sentiment. Now, what individual state legislatures do is a different question, right? Right. But um, within, you know, sort of the public discussion around the issue, there's this really strong sense that if Democrats act as crassly as Republicans do, they lose any ability to ever get out of this trap, right? Right. Because ultimately what you want is for redistricting to go to independent commissions. Sure. You know, it's just, it's, it's just, um, uh, frankly, I think we may have talked about this uh, another episode, but um, it's a, it, it actually is a technological question. When I worked a redistricting session in the Texas legislature in 93, it took a couple of days to model out uh, a set, sets of districts. We would wait to get these big paper maps that we'd unroll on the desk to see what the lines would be. And nowadays, they can do that in milliseconds, right? right? So they can slice and dice these districts. Um, with a, well, I'll give you an example. I was doing ad targeting for um, uh, some some district you know, district level targeting stuff in Ohio, and it was so gerrymandered that the geograph. I was looking at the files that the uh, Facebook was using to target these things, and um, it, the shapes were ridiculously complicated. Uh, so uh, you know, you can you can tell the gerrymandering just by looking at how hard it is to target people there, right? Oh, yeah. Because they're not in they're not in compact groups, right? These different tentacles, you know, pointing out in all different directions. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it is partly a technological problem. So like the ability to make mischief. Right, in the old days was limited by the technology you had to draw maps. Right, right? Um, and nowadays, the, the you know basically the uh, the you know the potential for mischief is uh, is it's become unlimited. Yeah, so I think it's time that that you have to take the mischief out of the process. 
it, it re yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. And uh, again, I, I for many years uh, in Ohio, uh, my congresswoman was uh, Marcy Kaptur of the Toledo area. And as of course I mentioned, I live in the Greater Cleveland area. And I, I always used to, I always used to joke about this that they drew the line so it was basically five yards from the shore. And when we had high tide, we would be separated by Lake Erie. I mean, <laughs> Colin, that's how ridiculous it was. Well, you know, you saw some of those in districts in, uh, that were trying to connect black neighborhoods in Durham and Greensboro, <laughs> where the, the districts basically just followed the interstate. You know, right. it was like the interstate and the median. Yeah. I had said all along, uh, and this is going back to some of the earlier days of summer when we were looking at sports coming back, that any sport that's not looking at doing a bubble, I think, is kidding itself. So all along, I've seen landmines in this approach. In MLB's approach, I will agree that again, after some early problems in MLB, uh, that they have basically made it work. They haven't had to lose uh, as many games to this as, as we would have thought. I wonder if there is a lesson to be learned by any of these leagues here, because in the case of St. Louis in particular, one thing I was critical about was that again, this is a thing where it wouldn't necessarily be fair to the Cardinals, but my thing is, with the 60-man rosters, wasn't the whole idea of this thing you can bring up guys wholesale? I mean, in the NFL, I don't know what you would do necessarily here, but, uh, yeah, as you pointed out, because of the nature of this schedule, we can't afford to just twiddle our thumbs the way that MLB did with the Cardinals there. Oh, that's okay, just come back whenever you want to. You know, if they got a bunch of guys out, you may have to see a bunch of guys coming in, maybe like during the strike from their UPS job or whatever the case may be. But, you know, uh, these taxi squads, whatever it's going to be, uh, I would think that the NFL is probably going to be more proactive in terms of making sure, okay, it's at least going to be a bunch of guys wearing that team's uniform this week. Yeah, I mean, how do you do that, though? You know, you got to have players separate somewhere. I mean, at yes. that point, you might as well have, like, two replacement teams just Training somewhere totally different, waiting to, to yeah. bring into action as you know the Jets one week and the Washington football team the next, or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, it's, who uh, knows? It's really it's, uh, it's such an impossible situation for uh, you know all these leagues and teams to, to try to figure it out. And like baseball, I mean, changing some of the rules. We got seven innings, double headers. I mean, nothing's really sacred this year, right? Now they're talking about the NCAA tournament. Well, we'll just let everybody in. And, yeah. You know, because of the depth that Tampa Bay has. The fact that we could be saying these things when you're looking at the weapons of uh, Tampa Bay, we've talked about the running backs, uh, and again, between them, it's a nice thunder and lightning combo, if nothing else. Uh, wide receivers, uh, Godwin and Evans, and then you put Gronk in the mix, and Antonio Brown, Cameron Braid, I think, actually popped up once or twice during the playoffs here. So, you know, they got a lot to work with as well, but I agree with you on Kansas City. And uh, I have to give you this stat, courtesy of the Captain Comeback blog. Uh, Scott Kazmar, who is uh, such an excellent football writer, uh, this is something that's unbelievable. When a team scores first and when they don't. NFL averages since 2018, a team wins 60.8% of the time when they score first, 39.2% of the time when they don't. So it's important, unless you're Kansas City, because Patrick Mahomes is 23-5, and 82.1% when they score first, 21 and 4, 84% when they don't score first. So if they fall behind, and we've seen it, we've seen what they can do as far as just flipping a switch. And, and when you're looking at any potential holes in the game here, as far as, again, the, the health of their running backs has been up and down. But I can tell you 
from grim memory here, watching my Cleveland Browns get chewed up on the ground by them a couple weeks ago here, uh, that was not something I particularly expected. I expected all to be damage to be done by uh, Mahomes through the air, but Kansas City proving even in that game they can run the football when they want to. Again, albeit they had a functional, a fully functional offensive line at the time. We'll see what it's, it's like without Eric Fisher in there because for anybody that's looking for any of the breaks that Tom Brady's gotten over the years, the, the, the possibility of Tampa Bay's defense getting to Mahomes on a more regular basis. We saw it happen to Aaron Rodgers, what happened uh, when he didn't have his left tackle in the NFC Championship game, albeit as great as Rodgers has been, I think it's a bigger hill to climb, uh, no pun intended, to do that to Patrick Mahomes. So, yeah, this is just a thing here where it really has the potential to be really such a video game uh, kind of a feel to it here as far as what these offenses are able to do. And that is notwithstanding, like I said, Tampa Bay being elite defensively, at least at stopping the run, and, and Kansas City being at least good enough defensively. I said a year ago, they remind me of New Orleans the year they won the Super Bowl. The key with New Orleans was just get that defense to the middle of the pack and a defense that could be opportunistic and make some plays for you, but you don't have to be great with an offense like that. you got to get to the middle of the pack, and Steve Spagnuolo has helped carry them to that point, Tyron Matthew being in there and being such a great player, and they have a handful of other great players in there. They, they just have to be at a certain level, but both of these defenses, I think, obviously have to be the best version of themselves on Sunday. I absolutely agree, and I tell you what, if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers pull this off, uh, it's going to be there's going to be one coach that's going to be handed the game ball. Mm -hmm. Who, which coach do you think that's going to be? Are you going to say Byron Leftwich? No. Okay. I vote. Oh, okay. Yes, because he is going to have to be at, as creative and as disguisable as he possibly can to get to this young man, Patrick Mahomes. And if he does do that, then they have the, they have the kryptonite. That's the kryptonite. Mm -hmm. you, he cannot recognize, he cannot... He has to be incognito, 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 I'm sorry. He's going to have to be to where Patrick Mahomes is going to have a hard time disguising, I mean, recognizing uh, the, the coverages and the blitz pickups, the, the whole nine. He's, he's going to have to be extremely creative. And if he, if he can pull that off and, and disrupt this young man in a way on a consistent basis, the one, the one thing about Patrick Mahomes, though, He's like a magician. I mean, and, and the way that he can talk, can talk himself to throw a football with accuracy, you know, when the normal quarterback won't even think twice about, wouldn't even think about doing, Todd Balls is going to have to, and if he does, if he's able to do this, and that is throw a package at Mr. Mahomes that, that, that confuses him, yeah, he'll be given a game ball. From your perspective and being intricately aware of all of the business facets, of everything in the NHL, specifically with everything on the ground in Edmonton there. How did the process sort of unfold for Edmonton, not just to become one of the two hub cities, but in the end, the hub city, the one that hosts the finals as well? What was that looking like as the process was going on and talks were happening with the organization? Well, as you'll recall, the regular season ended maybe a dozen, 13 games left for most teams. And in talking to this time, they were going to do two bubbles in the playoffs. One in Vegas, one in Chicago, perhaps, East West thing. But I, uh, there was a flare up, obviously, with COVID in the States, and they, they started looking north of the border. Toronto ended up being the East Bubble, and Edmonton ended up being, being the West Bubble, and they've done a great job in Canada in general, and in Alberta in particular, with, with putting a clamp on the virus as soon as it became something that the people had to worry about. Um, and that's, that part is about Four and a half million people total between Calgary and Edmonton and everybody else. About four and a half million people. And it's only been uh, about 220 deaths from the virus the whole time. So we were locked in. We, were, we had good protocol going. But I think one thing that really hurt on the top, for Edmonton anyway, which I can speak of, is there's a JW Marriott brand new attached right to the arena. So the teams that stayed there literally never had to go 